Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. This is Quick Study, a television program designed to take you through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation all in one year. This year we're in the New Testament, some interesting things happening. Corey, what's up? Today, we are going to be focusing in on what happened after the history of the New Testament was completed, and we're focusing in on Rome. Excellent, very good, the capital of the empire. Now, what are you doing? Well, today we're going to talk a little bit about Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. All right, verses 1 through 4 of Romans 11. That'll be interesting because mm -hmm. that deals with the people. That's right. Uh, anyway, Ryan is here. Ryan, what's up? Today I'm looking at the gospel message in the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis, the gospel message. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, all of this and more is coming your way. I'm going to be teaching on something interesting. The Jewish people are diversified. There are many who actually believe in Jesus Christ. So this is going to be an interesting teaching today as we focus on Romans. And uh, as we do that, we're going to be looking at the Jewish people and some others. So get your Bible guide out, get your Bible out. It is time to study on through the Word of God. As we study through the New Testament of the Bible, you'll notice that the historical portion of the New Testament largely ends with the book of Acts. And then when we move into Romans, we get more of the pastoral letters. So right now, you and I are going to continue that history. After the death of Emperor Nero, there was a year of battle for leadership, finally won out by Vespasian, a Roman general who had been resisting the Jewish revolt of 66 AD. When he became emperor with the nomination and support of the military, he had just besieged the city of Jerusalem, which would culminate in the destruction of the city in 70 AD. Vespasian then ruled for 10 years without much political turmoil. After his death of natural causes, the Senate named his son and army commander Titus emperor in his place. Titus was only emperor for three years, but unfortunately, those three years were filled with three natural disasters. First, the eruption of Mount Vesuvius that destroyed Pompeii, followed by a fire and a plague in Rome. Dealing with these massive blows to the empire, Titus caught a fever and died less than three years into his reign. Titus's brother Domitian took his place as emperor and at first seemed to be a pretty good, albeit strict, ruler. He was preoccupied with upholding traditional Roman morality within society and used spies and witnesses to condemn violators and traitors, though evidence shows he had nowhere near the same standards for his own life. A hint at problems to come existed in his taking of the name Lord and God. The message of this title was clear. No one needed to elect him. He was Lord. He was God. In his mind, his right to rule was divine and unshakable. Perhaps this contributed to his massive persecution of Jewish and Christian communities that broke out several years into his reign. Commonly called atheists because they worshipped an unseen god instead of the emperor or the pantheon of Roman gods, Jews and Christians were targeted as persons to be cleansed out of the empire. It was during this time that church father Clement of Rome wrote his letter to the Corinthians. John the Apostle was banished to Patmos, and two members of Domitian's family were executed for their faith. So the angle of early church history that you and I are taking today, this viewpoint, is a viewpoint uh, from the Roman Empire, this official Roman history. Now we could also take a look at early church history through uh, the eyes of the early church fathers and the apostolic fathers, the, the writings of the early church fathers. And But we're going to save that for uh, another day on Quick Study. Today we're going to continue to focus on this official uh, Roman history through the 
Roman Empire. We've already taken a look at Domitian. Uh, now, Emperor Domitian, uh, his father was Vespasian. His brother was Titus. Uh, both emperors of Rome before him, they were responsible for the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70. And this family, uh, they, they're called the Flavian family, Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian. And they actually adopted into their family Roman Jewish historian uh, Josephus, which is why we know him today as Flavius Josephus. Now, uh, Josephus really gives us an eyewitness account into the first century history of Rome, especially when it pertains to Judea and Jerusalem and the destruction of that temple. Uh, but we're going to uh, go even a little bit beyond AD 70, right up into around AD uh, 81. We're going to be taking a look at the construction and the use, the history of the Roman Colosseum. So stick around. We're going to look at that later. As we read and understand the book of Romans, we must hear what Paul the Apostle is actually saying. Paul was a Jew trained by the most learned people in the Jewish law. He wrote to the church at Rome, the leading city of the Roman Empire. Today it is known as the home of the Vatican. The church is so much more than material possessions or physical location. The church is the people of the Lord and the Savior, and the world's Savior. They follow and they serve Him as Lord of their lives. These people are amazing. And this time we have seen unique things revealed through human history. We are in the end times, and the Jewish people are important. Now this is the only nation in the Middle East that is so small, yet calls itself a democracy. Paul continued to speak of his people and of the Jewish religion in that nation. Romans 11, verses 1 through 12. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite, of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded, just as it is written. God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear to this very day. And David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened, so that they do not see and bow down their backs always. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now if their fall is riches for the world, and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Romans chapter 11 verses 1 through 12.
It is amazing as we continue to go through the New Testament what we discover today. And as we look at the last part of Romans, as we look at all of this, we learn that God still deals with the Jewish people. And we need to focus on that in just a moment. But before we do, go get your Bible guide because we're going to talk about that. And I've put together a special presentation each day for the Bible guide. Get your Bible and your Bible guide and join us. If you don't have it, write to the addresses on the screen. And also let me say that you can go to www.biblediscoverytv.com. And when you get there, click on donate, donate in any amount. It'll take you to the page where we have the Bible guide. Very interesting. And we have a 24 seven television station there at www.biblediscoverytv.com for you. So you can watch it anytime you want. Now, as we look at this, I, I begin to understand our steps of faith. And I, I said, this is something fascinating. We need to talk about the Jewish people fall. What does that mean? And if you're Jewish, I wanna to talk to you because this particular scripture comes to you from Paul, who is a Roman, or who is actually a Roman citizen, but he's a Jew who was trained by Gamaliel, one of the leading Pharisees of the day. And I want to tell you about that because it's important that we talk about it. We're reading Romans chapter 11 to 13, and we're looking at Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 12. Now, as we focus on that, let's get to the scripture and learn what God is saying to us. It says, I say then, God cast away his people. Has he cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham and the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he forsook. Now this is interesting. Or he foreknew. Or do you not know that the scripture says of Elijah, now listen carefully, how he pleads with God against Israel saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. And I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? It says, I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed knee to Baal. Now, isn't that amazing? And as we learn, the Jewish people are diversified. There are many Jewish believers today's, in today's world. This is so important because there are people who are Gentiles like myself, and there are individuals all over the world like that. But the Jewish people, there is a group of Jewish people who believe Jesus Christ is the Lord, that Jesus Christ is the one. And they are not uh, you know, out there and didn't uh, do this or didn't do that. And they're not Jewish in that sense, but they're Jewish true to form, knowing that Jesus Christ is their Lord. This is very important for us to understand. And we need to think this through carefully. And then in verse 5, Romans chapter 11 continues with this idea. It says, even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Wow, that's great. There's a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. He says in verse 7, what then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that should not see and ears that they cannot hear or should not hear to this very day. That's a quote from Isaiah 6. It's fascinating. The Jewish people are those who love God through Jesus Christ or they do not. And there is a very real fact here. The Jewish people either love God or they do not love God. And those who love God are fully experienced in this and they know Jesus is Messiah and they're celebrating all the feasts, they're celebrating all the tabernacles that way. And it's exciting to see that. Now this is Romans chapter 11. Paul wrote this to the Roman church and that's the church in the empire city uh, capital. So that's very important that we understand. Now look at chapter 11, verse nine says, 
And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back always. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fullness be? Beloved, so important. The Jewish people have not stumbled to fall, but to make a choice. What do they believe about the one called Jesus Christ? Now, this is important. I want to be clear about this. John 14 is clear. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no man comes to the Father unless they come through me. So if we're going to receive the gift of heaven, deal with our sin, deal with all of the issues that are a part of our life, then what we need to do is understand that Jesus Christ is Lord and come to him. And the same with the Jewish people. And beloved, I know many Messianic Jews. They are amazing people. Chosen People Ministries is one group we work with. And I want to tell you something. They are exciting. And so we need to understand that the Jewish people are not washed away, but we need to pray and witness to them. One of the most famous tourist attractions in Rome today is still the Colosseum. Now, when the New Testament was being written, largely, uh, it was not yet completed. It was dedicated in AD 81. Let's take a look at the Colosseum. The ancient Colosseum of Rome has become one of the most recognized buildings of history. Still standing today was ancient Rome's largest amphitheater and the first built entirely from stone. The Colosseum was inaugurated in AD 80, housed over 50,000 spectators, and is famed to have been the place to watch gladiator battles and wild animal hunts. Stories of Roman mythologies were also performed with awe-inspiring sets, and the arena was even flooded to a accommodate mock naval battles. Originally, it was called Amphitheatrum Flavium, named after the family of emperors who built it. In the 8th century AD, several hundred years later, it became known as the Colosseum, named after a colossal statue of Nero nearby. When Vespasian, who began the Colosseum project, was named emperor, Rome was financially drained. The previous emperor, Nero, had spent extravagantly and a great costly fire had ravaged Rome in AD 64, which led to a great persecution of Christians by Nero. Even though Rome was in a financial sinkhole, Vespasian and his son Titus are known for their great building projects, especially the Colosseum. So where did their money come from? on monuments, in Roman histories, and now on a reconstructed inscription from the Colosseum, the Roman word for booty or plunder is used to speak of the great wealth of Vespasian and Titus. The only war that Vespasian and Titus won that would have afforded them great plunder was their suppression of the Jewish revolt that ended in the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. That gold-plated temple refurbished by Herod the Great, the temple to whom wealthy Jews would often will their fortunes, religious taxes were paid yearly, and political leaders gifted articles of gold and silver. It was a treasure trove, and Titus took it. During his victory parade back in Rome, Josephus says that silver and gold flowed like a river. Some of the temple articles were put on display, and according to history, the rest was sold and used to build the Colosseum. Tithes and offerings are life disciplines that have been taught in Christianity from the very beginning. But why? If God doesn't need our money and already knows us better than we know ourselves, then why? 
This month, we here on Quick Study Television have taken time to go back into our vault to review a sermon given by Rod Hembry in the face of the 2008 financial crisis. In this sermon, Rod tackles the issue of giving. Not mincing words, he discusses the so-called prosperity doctrine and highlights moments from the life of Christ that shed light on this divisive issue. To get your copy of this sermon, please help keep our ministry strong with a suggested donation of $15. And don't forget to ask for It's More Than Money, a timely message from 2008. Thank you for staying with us here on Quick Study Television as we go through the Bible in one year. I'm glad you're here. Next time on Quick Study, I'm going to be talking about judgment as we focus on this. God is the one we serve. Now we serve Him, so we must never pass judgment on others. And how are we going to do that? We'll talk about that and more, especially in today's Twitter world and today's Facebook world. Very interesting. Anyway, Ryan, what's up? Well, I know we're in the New Testament right now, but as you've probably heard us say on this program before, the Old Testament is actually the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is really the Old Testament revealed. Now, this is very true. Let's take Genesis 5, for example. Some mysteries of the Bible are hidden in plain sight, such as the case for Genesis chapter 5. In this passage, a genealogical record of the family of Adam, ten Hebrew names are presented. These are proper names, however, so they are not translated, but only transliterated to approximate the way they were pronounced. This leads us to question what these names signify in English, an investigation which requires the study of the original roots. The very first name and man of the human race, Adam or Adama, fittingly means man. Genesis chapter 5 verse 3 reveals that Adam begot a son in his own likeness, after his image, and that he named him Seth. Seth means appointed, as Eve explains in Genesis 4.25. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. Seth's son was Enosh, meaning mortal or frail, while Enosh's son, Kenan, can mean sorrow, dirge, or elegy. Kenan's son Mahalalel means the blessed God, and Mahalalel's son Jared means shall come down, from the verb yarad. Jared was the father of Enoch, Enoch meaning teaching or commencement. The name of Enoch's son was Methuselah, which comes from two roots, muth meaning death, and chalak meaning to send forth or to bring. So Methuselah means his death shall bring. Methuselah's son was Lamech, meaning lamentation or despairing. And Lamech named his son Noah, derived from Nechem, which as he himself explains in Genesis 5.29, means to bring relief or comfort. And he, Lamech, called his name Noah, saying this one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands, because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. Assembling these name meanings in sequence, reveals a hidden message. Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down, teaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest. That is remarkable. It is God's entire plan for redemption, the gospel presented right here in only the fifth chapter of the Bible. Now, the implications of this discovery are deep and are many not the least of which is the fact that right here in Genesis 5, God already had a plan in place for our redemption, which was to send Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, to earth to die on our behalf on a wooden cross. Of course, this is exactly what happened as revealed in the New Testament. Fascinating. 
Yeah, it is actually fascinating. The gospel uh, in Genesis, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. It now, is interesting. You studied uh, today, what mm -hmm. did you study? Romans 11, 1 through 4? Exactly, yes. And I know that much of your lesson today was focused on that. And so I'm just going to, because of time constraints, go over some bullet points here that I'd like to, to bring out. So we're going into chapter 11 of Romans as Paul continues explaining that the unbelief of Israel is no argument against the gospel. Israel's blindness is not total, and God is still working with the nations. I want to remind us that in the days of Samuel, the nation of Israel rejected God as their king and chose a human king, yet God continued to work with his people. In Samuel's address on the day of Saul's coronation to the nation of Israel, he writes in 1 Samuel 12, verse 22, the Lord will not abandon his people because of his great name and because he has determined to make you his own people. Now let's move forward in time. In Paul's time, they had rejected Jesus as King Messiah and their leaders said, as recorded in John 19, verse 15, we have no king but Caesar, but God was and is not finished with them. Paul himself was evidence that God was saving some Jews, God's election of the nation. Even in times of national apostasy, God saves a remnant. And, and it's important as well because we're in the time of the end days. That's right. And we have Israel again. We sure do. Uh, you know, Israel is out of, uh, went out of, uh, existence in yes. AD 70 to 74, yes. Yes. and it's been out of existence ever since until 1948, came back in existence, and this is a really interesting time. And we pray for the peace of Jerusalem every day as, as believers in Jesus <laughs> We do, Christ. and we pray for the Jewish people because they're great. This is the most important time in history for the Jewish people. We must understand the end of time is significant for Israel. The truth of the arrival of Jesus Christ is that it previewed the worst times in human history. We see in Romans 11 that God is involved with his people and the Jewish people. There is great hue and cry for the Jewish people to come to Jesus Christ. But what does that mean? Simply, it means to see him as Lord, as Messiah, promised them by the laws of God. You know, Jesus Christ is real, and I love telling you about him at the end of the program. And this is the time when you have an opportunity, an opportunity to come to Christ and have eternal life. Now, when you come to Jesus Christ, you simply pray. And when you pray, you have to remember that Jesus Christ must be Lord of your life. So you pray, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I believe you died on the cross and rose again and be the Lord of my life. And when you do that, God changes everything. 